Hello everyone, this is James Shore with another Test Driven Development video. Today is August 25th. I'm picking up uh, with a new batch of episodes. Uh, you know, I was looking at the videos today and thinking to myself, that looks like fun. So rather than waiting to get feedback on the last video like I said I was going to, I'm just, you know, carrying on. Um, and there's also another exciting thing that I'd like to mention. Um, by the time I record this video, we will have passed the one year mark for Let's Play TDD. I believe that I started doing Let's Play TDD videos in, on August 31st of 2010. Uh, I'm recording this now on August 25th of 2011, but I believe it's going to go up sometime after that. I'm a little, I'm a little uncertain about exactly when that is. But if we look at the archive here, archive, yeah, very first one. August 31st, and um, let's see, the original announcement was, yeah, August 31st. So that's that's pretty exciting. Uh, a year of episodes, still really enjoying doing them. I hope you're enjoying watching them. Um, so thanks for coming along with me on this ride. It's really been fantastic. Uh, so yay us. All right, insert, you know, cheesy sound effect here. So now, at the end of the last episode, just to catch everybody up, if you're if you're just coming in, what we've been doing is creating a financial application, a little tool to replace a very complicated spreadsheet I have that helps me manage my personal long-term finances. This is basically make sure that in retirement I will have enough to eat because I live in the U.S. and if you don't do it now, you won't eat later. So. Um, the, the actual spreadsheet I have is way more complicated than this, but I want to replace it because it's really slow. I'm using Apple's numbers spreadsheet tool, and that numbers is many things, but it is not fast. Um, but I can't... Anyway, uh, to make a long story short, I want to write a program to replace it. That's what this is all about. I've spent a year, gotten about a week worth of programming done. Uh, I think that spreadsheet's here to stay, but, you know, whatever. Uh, having a lot of fun with it regardless. So... Where we are at is we are doing some basic stuff. We are pretending to have a stock market uh, account, a portfolio that uh, has a certain starting balance, a certain amount of purchases in that uh, account, and a certain amount of yet yearly spending out of that account. And then we're looking at how much we sell every year, the taxes on that, and tracking it up forth until we die, which happens here, 2050. Um, so even this is, is still a toy. Uh, you can't really use this for anything because we don't have the ability to put in the number of years, the tax rate, anything like that. The tax rate and the interest rate or the, the stock market return are both pretty fictional. But, um, you know, it's it's been fun. So at the end of the last video, I said that I was going to put in the other fields. We've got, you know, we need to put in the, the year and the length of time and so forth. And I also talked about architecture. And in thinking about that, since I last recorded, I realized I want to do what the lean folks call the latest responsible moment, which is that I don't want to introduce architecture until I absolutely have to. And if you remember, architecture is the, is the repeated decisions. Uh, it's the things that are hard to change. And I believe the job of the agile architect is to make those decisions as small, as few in number as possible. You want to make things easy to change as an Agile architect. So you want to, paradoxically, the, the job of the Agile architect is to prevent architecture from occurring because architecture is the stuff that's hard to change, generally as reflected by repeating patterns in your system. And by repeating patterns, I mean the stuff that you do over and over again, the, the way you approach the world, uh, if you're thinking about it in terms of network architecture, it would be the fact that you've got a web server and a database server, and every piece of your system sort of relies on those facts, so changing it can be very difficult. The job of the Agile architect is to make those changes easy and thus turn them from being architecture to just simple design decisions. So as soon as I introduce more, more fields here, I've created architecture because now I have a repeated decision, a repeated approach, which is that this dialer text field thing and the idea of self-renderables and render targets which uh, if you remember way back when when we did that around episode 80 
was not a super popular design approach, um, which is, I have to admit, one of the reasons I like it. So, given that, given that it's not a super popular design approach, given that going in and creating new fields would start to lock that design approach in, I want to avoid making that decision. So rather than putting in the other fields, which would just, you know, sort of be a mechanical, let's build on this design we've already got, what I want to do is start getting into additional design concepts that haven't come up yet, which hopefully will reveal the flaws in the self-renderable approach and other design decisions I've made, allow me to fix them now before architecturitis sets in and those decisions become harder to change. Now, those decisions aren't going to be super hard to change because this is a small app. Uh, it's not like we've got a thousand classes all following the same patterns that we want to keep consistent. But uh, I still I, I want to make changes easy. I hate re repetitive, dull work. So, yeah. You know, so, Jim, why are you a programmer? Well, good question. But, uh, no, actually, I, I think programming is not repetitive and dull. It's an enormously creative activity, and I have a lot of fun with it. But one of the reasons it is fun is because you can make active efforts to prevent the repetitive dull parts from happening. You're a programmer. You automate everything. If it's repetitive and dull, the computer should do it for you. So, long story short, I don't want to do this. I want to do something else. Um, and the something else, I think, should be persistence. I think it's time to start putting in a persistence layer. Now, I've been avoiding this for a long time. Uh, I haven't even been thinking about it in the shower or anything like that. I have no idea how to get persistence into this. One thing I do know is that I probably don't want to do a database because that's more complex than this little application needs. Um, but we still need some sort of persistence layer, and, if, and we want it to be possible to put in a database in the future. Um, I don't want to design for a database, but I want it to make it, I don't want to design my way, you know, I don't want to design in a way that will prevent a database. So there's that. Um, there's also these other little cases that I think can probably wait for later. Um, so, yeah, I think it's time for persistence. Persistence, by the way, if you're not familiar with that term, simply means saving the data between runs. Um, that's why it doesn't necessarily involve a database, although it usually does. Um, however, in this little application, there's, there's only four things we need to save right now. One is the starting balance, second is the cost, third is the yearly spending, and fourth is where the window's at, and so it's size and position and other UI things. That's what persistence means for us. So uh, values of fields and UI positioning, really. I think what I want to start with is the values of the fields. Uh, that will get us into more fundamental design questions like, um, you know, is this self-renderable idea a good one? And uh, hopefully exposes you know, those fundamental concepts. The UI positioning is important as well, but sort of less so. Um, there's also the question of what kind of UI I want to put around persistence. I think a simple file dialog is probably the right thing to do here. So rather than doing something like Mac OS Lion does, where it just kind of remembers, um, that's a very cool little thing. But I think a more traditional interface where you're opening a file would be the right thing. So, where to start? Um, like I said, I haven't really been thinking about this, so I'm not sure of that answer. But let me try to channel the spirit of Ron Jeffries. Ron Jeffries isn't dead, but I'm going to channel his spirit anyway. So, oh great Ron, how would you approach this? I think Ron would say, well, just do something and just, you know, create a file already. So, let's see. We were trying to do a little bit of vertical integration. 
um, meaning that we want this to connect to the model and to the UI. So values of fields. Maybe we should start with the UI positioning because that's really fundamental. Hmm. Um, what if we just started with the name of the file? Yeah, if we just started with the file name and nothing else, um, that could sure be interesting. So like, like we have here in the Eclipse bar, it says the name of the file and then it's Eclipse. So we, what if we had our program say example dot, you know, finances or whatever, dash financial projector. That would be interesting and that would start to allow us to sneak up on the problem of file system stuff um, without having to figure out some of the bigger questions of how do we hook into the domain model and everything else. So let's start by giving ourselves the ability to open a file. We just want to be able to say file, open file. Um, and that means that we'll need a menu. Now we could dive into the persistent side of things without a menu, and that could be really interesting, and I know some people are really eager to get the persistent stuff going, but how would I trigger that for manual testing? Um, now that we have something that we can manually test, I like having the ability to manual test because it allows me to check my assumptions, especially when it comes to fundamental Java library stuff that I don't understand. I can test my understanding, but I can't write unit tests that confirm that my, my beliefs are correct, as I've mentioned before. So, yeah, let's do that. Let's build a menu, a file menu. And in that file menu, let's put open file and that's all just open file and uh, then we'll put save save as and then maybe we'll put save or what if we put just put new new would be super easy because at this point we're not saving anything we could just say new and nothing would happen and that would be cool yeah, let's do file new. All right, that's what we're going to do. We're almost out of time for this video. Um, so I think what I'll do is I'm going to stop the video. So this is sort of a teaser for what's coming up next. Uh, I'm going to stop the video, do a little bit of a spike on how to do a file new. And next time we will get started on that. So thanks everybody for watching. That's where we're going to pick up next time. I'm looking forward to it. And happy birthday. It's been a year. Yes. All right. Talk to you later.